Well, it's, it's very common for uh, self-help teachers. Self-help books tend to be quite popular in the West. It's very common for self-help teachers to instruct their students about the power of the mind in terms of the trajectory that your life takes. They'll often talk about the power of positive thinking, the need to be optimistic in your outlook of life and to crush negative thoughts. And there's a lot of emphasis on the mind, the mind, the mind, the, the way you think, the way you process information has a significant influence in the direction that your life will take. And there's many books written addressing this subject, but sadly, many of these self-help gurus often fall into humanism. And what I mean by that is they teach others that you can be whatever you want if you just sort of think it into existence, that you can accomplish whatever you want if you just believe enough that you can achieve any success that you set your heart on merely through positive thinking, through strategic thinking. Now, these are falsehoods because in and of ourselves, because of the effects of sin upon humanity, our minds are literally polluted with stinking thinking, with faulty notions of self and God, and with selfishness that often excludes others from our pursuit of success, and on and on and on. There's all sorts of problems with this kind of self-help theology. And yet, at the same time, there is some truth to the idea that the way you think matters. How you think and what you think about has a significant bearing upon the direction that your life will take. But the key is to fill your mind, first of all, with truth from God, and then to organize it in such a way that you've properly understood it, and then to seek to put it into practice. In other words, to think Christianly. Let me give you uh, a few verses that speak of the power of the mind and the need to train our minds upon the things of God. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we must take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Romans 12.2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so self-help teachers do have a certain aspect of truth to their teaching. It's misguided, but there is truth to the fact that we are called to be transformed in the way that we think as Christians, especially in the evangelical world. We often put, I think, an undue amount of emphasis on our hearts. I'm giving my heart to Jesus. Well, he wants your mind to I'm being led by my feelings. Well, God just told me. It's like, well, I understand there's an emotional, subjective dynamic to Christian spirituality. But fundamentally, your heart will go the direction that your mind is headed in. So it's really important for us to become clearer thinkers and also to be thinking about the right thing. So your mindset matters. The way you think about life matters. Now, what I want to do this morning is I want to just focus in on one little sliver of Christian thinking. And that is the way we think about ministry in particular matters. And this is the subject that I think comes off the pages of uh, Acts chapter 14. We're going to look at the, the last portion of Acts 14, verses 7 to 28. And we're going to ask questions like, when I think about ministry... Each of us, for Christians, are called to serve Christ. Do I consider, for example, the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of Christ, being a Christian witness? In my mindset, is this normal, or do I still think it's kind of weird? Do I think of ministry, doing ministry, preaching the gospel as normal, or is it kind of an odd thing to do? When I do ministry, am I marked by faith? Do I actually have faith? Is this part of my mindset? Do I actually believe that God is working in this world that I live in? Is that part of my mindset? 
How do we respond when people may idolize us or rely upon us or become codependent upon us in ministry? How do I process that? How do I process persecution? When I'm persecuted, do I assume God must have abandoned me? Or do I lean in and do I seek to learn and leverage what God is teaching me through persecution? So your mindset matters. We're going to focus specifically on a ministry mindset in our message. And the overarching truth I want to communicate is that a successful ministry mindset must focus on Christ. We need to remind ourselves that if we're going to be successful in ministry, we have to remind ourselves it's all about Jesus. He's worth it. It's all about Jesus, and he is very much worth it. So here's principle or truth number one that answers one of the questions I already asked. And that is, if we're going to be successful in Christian ministry, in our minds, we need to lock down this truth that preaching should be our norm. There should be nothing abnormal or weird or oddball about opening your mouth and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing embarrassing about it. There's nothing that we should be ashamed of. We preach about unapologetic preaching in our church, but that doesn't just apply to the pastoral staff. All of us should be willing to open our mouths and preach the gospel. So in Acts 14, we see yet another example of these early Christian leaders preaching the gospel. No matter where they go, they're preaching the gospel. It doesn't say they're at the mall, they're out in the ice rink. They're preaching the gospel. Everywhere they go, they preach the gospel. And that should be true of our lives as well. Look at verse seven, very simply. And there they continued to preach the gospel. They had just been run out of another town. They'd been persecuted. They had to flee. So they go to another place. They didn't say, well, it didn't work in the last place, so we should change our tactics in this place. We were persecuted there, so we're going to lay low now. No, they just continued to preach the gospel. And as you stack this verse on top of multiple other verses in the book of Acts, you'll see time and time again, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. That's normal. That's normal. They got up in the morning, they preached the gospel. They got up the next day, they preached the gospel. They got run out of one town, they went to another town, they preached the gospel. How many of you preached the gospel this week? See, for many of us, it's abnormal to preach the gospel. It's rare. Maybe once a year, maybe some by some series of events, someone comes and asks us about our faith, and, and it's like, I'm not used to this. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to win the world for Christ, we have to do our part in preaching the gospel. We should say there's nothing new here, folks. There's nothing particularly abnormal about Acts 14.7. We've seen it again. And again and again, they preached the gospel. They normalized it. They normalized it. May I encourage you to make the proclamation of the gospel normal. As normal as eating, as normal as breathing, as normal as driving your car, as normal as shopping for groceries. Regularly, habitually preach the gospel. On occasion, I will have a Christian whose heart's been stirred. They want to do a better job in evangelism. They'll come and they'll say, What are some tactics? What are some things I could do to be more effective at preaching the gospel? And my best advice is you're overthinking it. You don't need to take a course. You don't need to read a book on it. If the gospel has arrested you and changed you, talk about it. You know what the gospel is. You know that you're a sinner, that Christ died for your sins, that you've been transformed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to take a course. You don't need to go to seminary. You don't need to have a PhD in theology to preach the gospel. Just share Christ with people. Be casual about it. The more you do it, the more natural it will seem. I remember when I was a little kid, maybe four or five years old, I wanted to learn to ride a two-wheel bicycle. So I went out in my driveway. We had these railroad ties down the driveway, and I just sat on my bike. I put my foot on it. On the railroad tie, I tried to balance. When I went to fall, I put my foot on it, tried to balance. And over time, I got my balance. And then I just rode off. Now, at first, it seems kind of weird. I'm riding a bicycle. Wow. Look at me, Mom. Look at me, Dad. I'm riding a bicycle. And after a while, it's just completely normal. I remember when I first started driving. I didn't know the difference between the brake and the gas. In fact, my grandfather came over to change the oil in our car. Super embarrassing. 
and our car had a bit of, our driveway had a bit of a slant to it. I was 14. This is before I was driving. I said, Aaron, just jump in the, jump in the car and, and roll it back a couple feet so I can get under. Well, I got in the car, started rolling it back, and I realized I don't know how to stop this thing. And I literally rolled it right into a ditch and up against the pine tree. It's embarrassing, but I, I didn't know. Now I don't get in the car and think, oh, which is the brake, which is the gas? I can't remember. It's like second nature. And the more you preach the gospel, the more natural it will become. Is gospel preaching normal for you? Is it a normal part of the conversation you have in your homes? Is it normal for you to talk about Christ at work? Is it normal for you to bring these kinds of subjects up with your neighbors? If we're going to be successful, it has to be normalized. Second mindset we need to adopt. We need to remember that God alone does the impossible. This is a huge relief. We don't have to manipulate anyone into the kingdom. God alone does the impossible. Look at what God does in the life of one man. There's just one example here, but it, apply, it can apply to many, many people throughout history. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting, listen to the, the repeated language of the text, which emphasizes how futile his circumstances were. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. Now in case you're not locking into what that means, he was crippled from birth. In case you're not locking into what that means, and he had never walked. So three times in three different ways, we're told this man cannot walk. And he's never been able to walk. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. It doesn't say he, he was slowly lifted up. He went to a therapist and over the course of many months, they taught this man how to walk. It doesn't say he was given braces or crutches or a wheelchair. He goes from zero to 60. He didn't learn to walk again. He had never walked. But by the wonder-working power of God, he is transformed. And in the word of God, there are numerous instances where people are healed emotionally, spiritually, socially, physically, economically by the power of God. Little help would have been available for a man like this. In our culture, we have all sorts of social safety nets, social security nets in our, 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 our country. Little help would have been available for this man. There were no therapists. People weren't out earning degrees in physiotherapy or these sorts of things. There were no monthly paychecks for people that couldn't work. This man had to beg for a living. And yet, as he listens to the gospel preach, Paul, probably by the strength of the Holy Spirit, discerns in this man that he had faith in Christ. And so that faith in his specific circumstance is rewarded with physical healing. It's a great reminder of the power of God, not just over the physical, but over all of life. So, I had a Christian brother tell me this many years ago, and I thought, this is a helpful distinction. In the area of healing, in the area of salvations, what should my mindset be? And then he distinguished two words for me. I thought, this, this is a good distinction. He said, we should never expect God to heal, to save. That's for a very presumptuous word. I expect it. It's almost like we're trying to twist God's arm or manipulate him. But we should anticipate it. Because expectation is presumptuous, but anticipation has this sense of, I believe it, and I'm hopeful that God will, but God can do whatever he wants. And I really appreciated that distinction. I think this is symptomatic of a proper Christian mindset. We need to have faith. That doesn't necessarily mean that our faith is going to force God's hand, because God is sovereign. But God does respond to the faith of his people. He does. He responds to the prayers of his people. This is why we're called to pray without ceasing, to present our requests, our petitions before the Lord. This is why in the Psalms, we have numerous examples of great men of the faith like David praying, begging God to rescue them or heal them. Hezekiah was healed of his infirmities by 
God. Humanly, things were hopeless. But this man had faith and God blessed him with physical healing. Do you have faith in God's power to do the impossible? Maybe you've been praying for someone for many years and you're like, I, I might as well just give up. There's, there's absolutely no way God's going to break through on this one. The country's broke. There's absolutely no way there's going to be reform. I'm just going to wait for Jesus to come back. My marriage is kind of rocky, kind of shaky. There's no way God could break through and do the impossible. Well, God can. And we need to put our faith in God, not presumptuous faith, but hope-filled, anticipatory faith that he can do amazing things. This man's healing was instantaneous and it was holistic. And it's yet another example scattered through the book of Acts to illustrate the power and control over God, uh, of God over his creation. And I think, frankly, this event is set in the book of Acts to help us focus our attention upward on the wonder-working power of God. Now, as you do ministry and you see God at work, there's two things that arise in the text that we need to be aware of that can take our eyes off of Christ. Now, the first one is probably not super common. Some of you may hope it happens to you, (laughs) but it's still a distraction. The other one might be a little bit more common, but we need to address both. So the first one is, when you do ministry, you might over time develop fans. You're a youth leader. You're a successful musician. You're an effective counselor. You're an effective writer. You're an effective preacher. And you might develop a bit of a fan base. And those fans might start to give you credit that, in fact, is due Christ alone. So you need to be aware of this. So as the apostles are out doing this ministry, all of a sudden, people start to idolize them. Instead of Christ Jesus getting the credit, the apostles started getting the credit. Even in the church, there's this weird dynamic. We know it's about Jesus, but it's so easy for Christians to start to idolize other Christians, right? So look look and see what happens here. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconium, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now, the fact that they were speaking in a language Uh, unknown to Paul and Barnabas, explains why Paul and Barnabas didn't immediately react. They, They probably saw some ruckus or commotion, but they didn't actually understand what was going on. So these people go on to make preparations. Barnabas, they called Zeus. Paul, they called Hermes. You know, these, these gods from mythology because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice to the crowds. Obviously, this would have taken a bit of time to for this to get around, for him to go and bring the livestock in from the crowds or the fields. And the apostles don't seem to have yet clued in to what's going on because they're speaking in a foreign language. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments And they rushed out into the crowds, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So the the apostles finally catch on to what's going on. And their rebuke, their correction is swift and it is emphatic. There's no ambiguity about it. The first thing they do is they tear their garments. You might think that's kind of weird. But in their culture, that was a sign of repentance And it's like on behalf of the people, they're rending their garments. They're tearing their garments to say, this is an atrocious act. Please do not idolize us. Please do not worship us. 
in their message to their these idolatrous people, they stress that all humans are of the same nature. And we need to be reminded of this. People have different levels of prominence and culture in the church and the academy, but we're all the same, folks. We're all on an equal playing field. We are just flesh and blood made in the image and likeness of God. No one has a leg up over anyone else. And therefore, no human being, no matter how much you might appreciate them or idolize them, is worthy of your worship or homage. They stress that nothing in all creation is like God. God is unique. God is in a category all by himself. This is why it's an error in theology to try to explain God using the creation. It's, it's like you're getting it backward. We don't describe the Trinity using creation. Oh, if you want to understand the Trinity, look at a three-leaf clover. No, cr- creation is not sufficient to describe the grandeur of God. He is distinct and unique from the created order. And they remind the people of that. They remind them that God alone provides all material things, that he has manifested his presence, his beauty in the physical world by providing for them rain and crops and all sorts of good things. But unfortunately, in spite of the fact that was a pretty good sermon, They barely put a dent in the festivities. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. The people were just hell-bent on idolizing Paul and Barnabas. Now, this is an extreme example from a pagan society. But in the modern church, is it not also true that maybe in a more sophisticated way, There's a little bit of idolatry going on. You see people at Christian concerts. Oh, maybe I can get this person's signature. Oh, they sweat on me. You know, I was up front, you know, sat in the front row. I was able to touch them. They said hi to me. We may at times idolize, maybe not in as extreme ways as these people were, but musical artists, well-known preachers, movie celebrities, It's like if all you ever quote is the same preacher, probably not super healthy. If all you ever listen to is the same artiste, probably not super healthy. Now, there's nothing wrong with being known. There's people in the Bible who are named and people who aren't named. There's nothing wrong with being known, but we mustn't fall prey to the trap of idolizing other people. And by the way, it also protects you if you keep people in realistic perspective from being destroyed when they fail. You ever hear people, I'm leaving the church. Why? Because my pastor ran off with a secretary. Christians are all fake. Oh, so your faith was in your pastor? Really? You're going to abandon Christ because a Christian failed? I'm not a Christian. My parents were frauds and fakes and hypocrites. I'm leaving the church. Oh, so you weren't really a Christian. You were a Parenting. You were putting your faith in your parents? Like, we don't, we obviously hope the best for one another, but we don't worship one another. People, there will be people in this church that will fall away from the Christian faith. There will be people that let us down. There will be people who will be exposed for committing heinous sin. I've been doing this for a long time, 30 years, and I've seen it time and time. We've had pastors in our church that are no longer even Christians who have abandoned the Christian faith. But our faith is not in our pastors. Our faith is not in our parents. Our faith is not in our favorite mentor or counselor or youth leader or Christian artist. Our faith is in Christ. And unless you hitch your faith to Christ, you're going to be up and down like a yo-yo because Christians will succeed and Christians will fail. And this is just part of the, the history of the world. So ultimately, let's make sure that we avoid the personality cults that are so common in our society and point one another back to Christ. Now, perhaps more commonly than that is the opposite, which is persecution. So they they experience the the potential obstacle of, of idolatry and then more opponents who come to persecute them. 
And things change on a dime. So one minute, there's sacrifices being offered for these guys. And on the, the next moment, they're being stoned. It's amazing how quickly things can turn. The Bible says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Well, they had just ministered there. So now they're like chasing them down. They'd ministered in Antioch. They'd ministered in Iconium. It's like, well, we left your town. Leave us alone. But they're actually following them. Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds. What crowds? The same ones that moments earlier were worshiping them. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. So isn't this an amazing change of scenery in the narrative? This man, who was used by God to heal a lame man, who was then falsely worshipped, is now stoned. And then he is, in a sense, raised back to life by God. Their assumption that he was dead is, is pretty logical. Like you don't generally survive stonings, no matter how hard your head might be. When I was a kid, because of my last name, people used to mock me. Hey, rockhead. Hey, rockhead. So I, I said, well, yes, I have rocks in my head for hard thinking. And that sort of caused them to move off for a little bit. But no matter how hard your head is, you don't generally survive stonings, people pummeling you with rocks. So while the text doesn't say it was a miracle of God, I think that's what we're supposed to deduce from it. God had healed and protected this man from imminent death. And what does he do? He retires from ministry. He says it's too hard. I'm just going to move up into the boreal forests and live in a cabin. I'm going to throw in the towel. I'm going to blame God. I was faithful and he allowed me to be stoned. Is that what he does? No. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They went back into the lion's den. They went back to the places from which their persecutors and opponents had come. And look at the result, strengthening the souls of the disciples, which is a comprehensive term for people are built up in the faith. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. You'd think they were the ones that would need the message of encouragement, but they're, they've been, Paul's been stoned and he's out encouraging people, hey, persevere. Hey, keep it up. Stick with it. Don't give in. Don't run. Don't hide from your enemies. Keep preaching the gospel. He's encouraging them. And saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. See, he understood that the Christian life is not a cakewalk. It's not a cakewalk. There's going to be some very dark valleys. You know Psalm 23. Why would we have Psalm 23 if it wasn't true that we sometimes are in the dark valley of death? Psalm 23 is meant to help us to find perspective in the dark valleys of death, but it's also... Have you thought about the fact that it suggests that we will be in those on occasion? We will experience tribulation in this world. Sometimes God heals. And sometimes God allows tribulation in our lives. And so tribulation, hear this, doesn't mean that you've necessarily sinned or disappointed God, or that he's necessarily disciplining you, or that you're a bad Christian, or that you lack faith. It's part of God's sanctifying work in our lives. You can be faithful and sacrificial and still go through tribulation. And that does not mean that God's abandoned you. It's part of the walk toward heaven. It's part of what it means to be living under the reign of God, which is what the kingdom of God refers to. So somehow, this is what you got to reconcile in your own mind. Somehow, you must leave space for both possibilities in your life. Blessing and tribulation. Tribulation and blessing. And whether you're leaning more into the area of blessing or more into the area of tribulation, you need to continue to believe that God is working out his plan in your life. Do not abandon him. 
Do not throw in the towel. Do not give up. The devil, of course, wants to leverage our tribulation to silence us. Or worse yet, to blame God. How many people have we heard say something like, you know, I, I suffer, so I don't, I don't think God is, is real. I don't think God is true. Why would a good God allow suffering? Why are you even asking the question? The Bible teaches very clearly that in a broken world, we will suffer for Christ. And God uses both victories and tribulations to strengthen his church. He's done it throughout history. When it happens in our lives, we don't necessarily appreciate it, but it's true. So be encouraged by these words. The kingdom of God, God's rule, is made manifest through both the sufferings and the victories of his church as we continue to endure. So now they get these churches organized. It says in verse 23, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, and this was a spiritual exercise, it wasn't just a popularity contest, with prayer and fasting, means they consulted God earnestly. They committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. By the way, qualified a qualified plurality, meaning more than, more than one, a qualified, qualified plurality of elders is the most basic, necessary organizational element to a bona fide New Testament church. If you don't have two qualified elders, you don't actually have a dually organized New Testament church right? So it's really important that we have quality elders in our church and they must be appointed after consulting God. And if you get eldership wrong, it can be catastrophic. So you need to be careful and conscientious and prayerful about eldership. Once installed, they must be submitted to within the limits of their authority. And this is what we see Paul doing both here and in the book of Timothy and Titus. It was really important. Let's get some elders appointed, start to organize these churches. The most build, basic strategic building block to a, a New Testament church is qualified elders. And then, of course, on top of that, there needs to be the teaching of God's word, prayer, the administration of the Lord's Supper, the administration of baptism, collecting funds to support its ministers. The Bible says don't muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain collecting funds to meet the needs of the poor, and church discipline. These are the most basic elements of a New Testament church. So this is starting to take shape. Churches are starting to be formed up. So they're evangelizing people. They're starting to shape up local assemblies of, of, of believers. And then after all these ups and downs, they just continue in ministry. So this is the third part of the mindset we need to adopt. No matter what happens, we must keep witnessing and we must keep praising God. Looking up and looking out. Speaking to God and speaking to our neighbors. When they had passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Notice they're just, they're all over the place. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. They, they testified. They loved to talk about God's work in their lives and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And so they remained there no little time with the disciples. They lingered. They enjoyed the sweet fellowship. They enjoyed a bit of a Sabbath rest, I guess you could say, with this local church. They were proactive, emphasized this, they were proactive in going where unreached people were. And so should we. We should be proactive. Well, no one's asked me about Jesus lately. Have you brought it up? <laughs> no one's come to me and asked the question yet. Well, have you, have you brought it up? So we proactively going where, where people are. We need to remember as Christians, as much as we want to work on our own spiritual lives and Make sure we're squared up with the Lord and following him. There's a world out there that doesn't know about Christ. And we are Christ's lighthouse and Christ's embassy. We are his ambassadors. If we don't preach, who's going to preach? We live in a world and in a country and in a city where the vast majority of people are dying and going into a Christless eternity. Does that keep you up at night? Literally, 
rushing toward destruction. I had this weird thing happen this week. I was out burning a pile of wood in my backyard. And there's some tall grass around the fire. And as I'm watching the fire, this toad comes out of the grass and jumps toward the fire. And I thought, well, as soon as he feels the heat, he's going to turn. No, he jumped up some wood onto a flame and right into the fire. It was the weirdest thing. It's kind of disturbing, actually. If I ran over the toad with my lawnmower, I wouldn't think twice about it. But it was weird. This thing goes from life to death. He literally ran into the flames, into destruction. My wife said, that's a good sermon illustration. I said, I was already thinking that. <laughs> this is how people are. It's like they're, they're run, rushing toward destruction. Not toward life, but toward destruction. And this is as, as old as, as humanity itself. Very shortly after creation, listen to this damning indictment that God makes about humanity in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a pretty bleak and damning indictment of humanity. We are just bent toward destruction and towards evil. And we try to offset it with a few good deeds, but it doesn't hide the stench of our own sin. This is the world that we live in, and such were all of us at one point. Such were all of us. But by God's grace, many of us have been arrested by the gospel. We've been exposed to our sin and we've repented and we have found life and hope eternal in Christ. When you experience that, don't forget how blessed you, you, have, uh, you are and make sure that you're sharing that with others. Pointing out the sinful wickedness of humanity and then exposing them to the grace and mercy of Christ and calling people to repent and believe and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus, folks. This is what keeps you in the saddle. This is what keeps you on the path. This is what keeps you moving in the right direction. This is the mindset we have to adopt. Ministry is all about Jesus, and it's always worth it, whether your people are applauding you or trying to kill and stone you. It's all about Jesus. So let's make a concerted effort to open our mouths and to share Christ with anyone who will listen. He is our hope. He is our sole hope and the one in whom we can find eternal life. Do you believe this? If you do, tell other people about it. And may God use you to bear much fruit for his honor and glory.